Hello, Jonathan here again with another firearm from the stores. Two examples here because they have ever so slightly different history behind them. But it's one type. It's the Green Carbine. Green with an E, invented by James Durrell Green, an American, and actually an army officer, which is going to become significant uh, later on as well. So this is, this is what's known as a capping breech loader. By which we mean percussion caps, like a percussion firearm, like, like the muzzle loaders that came before it, but a breech loader. It's kind, it's kind of what it says on the tin, really. But um, <laughs> So you would, to actually ignite it, you would put a cap on here, or in this case, you would open this little door and insert a roll of caps, just like the ones that you used to shoot at your brother with in the garden. Um, which just make a noise. In this case, they produce enough of a flame um, into, the, into the breech to actually fire the cartridge that you've loaded. That I'll, show you, I'll show you how that was loaded in a moment. Now, this, this Maynard tape primer was standard on the pattern 18, sorry, the model 1855 Springfield rifle, uh, but it was found to be a bit too quirky and unreliable, and so it was ditched for the classic 1861 um, percussion rifled musket. Well, which is an indication, actually, that your standard infantry rifle remained, for the time being, a muzzle loader. But the cavalry often had need of a breech loader. And Britain was entering the Crimean War in 1855. That's the year after Durrell patented, um, sorry, Green, um, James D uh, Durrell Green patented this firearm. So some sort of emergency sort of combat troop trials were, were conceived of, um, whereby a, a purchase of 2,000 of these would be made. And, well, they'd, they'd undergo test and evaluation, but they wouldn't undergo a, a super rigorous trials process because the need was too great. Uh, the cavalry regiments had to have a modern arm because they were carrying not very good circa 1843 Victoria percussion carbine. So similar sort of format but very traditional and not breech loading. Now I keep teasing breech loading. Let's show you how that works on here. So the front trigger isn't a trigger. We pull that and we rotate to the left. You can see the, the great big locking lugs move out of, out of these um, huge claws on the, on the breech. And you can then slide it forward and then to the right. So multiple movements required. One, two, three, and four for the trigger. So let's pretend I've just loaded a paper cartridge into there. That's how you would complete the loading process. If we pop it back open again, I can show you the uh, detail of the breech. So the breech face of the actual, um, the gun bit, if you like, as opposed to the barrel bit, has um, a second nipple. Now, it's, it's, so if the percussion nipple, and incidentally, you could put a cap on that nipple still. You didn't have to use the main R tape primer. You could just cap it. The second nipple is a piercing uh, type. So it's shaped like a little, um, almost like a really brutal needle, but very short. It's replaceable because it would get worn um, by gas wash, by corrosion from potentially not completely cleaning everything, all, all the cor corrosion products off it. So that's replaceable but that would pierce the back of your cartridge. So you've, you've thumbed a cartridge into the breech, close it up, and what you'd actually have to do in, at the point of closing it is give it a bit of force because you've got to pierce the back of the cartridge. You've then connected your powder in the paper cartridge with the bullet in front of it, obviously, with your ignition system such that you can actually shoot the thing. Now, a feature of this firearm that I don't think anyone else has covered um, on the internet at least. Um, incidentally, Brian Knapp is, is the man on this. He's done, he's done a lot of the research. Thank you to him. Um, but that feature is this section here. You can see that it has a, a conical sort of lip on it, so you know something's going on. This is, you know, if you know, if you know firearms, you're thinking, okay, this is to stop gases escaping. 
but how would it, how would it achieve that? Well, if we look at the actual uh, patent for, for this gun, this whole section here, you can see it's a different color. It sits slightly proud of the, the actual back end of the gun, of the barrel. That is supposed to move. So they're all now frozen in place. In fact, the instructions for use for this thing actually say, do not allow this, this component to become rusted in place because it's part of how it's supposed to work. And that is that when you fire it, this whole thing moves very slightly backward into this cavity around the piercing nipple. And that seals the gun against the gas escaping. So you don't lose velocity, which affects the performance of the shot, and you don't get gas jetting out all over the place that will erode the metal of the gun, potentially hurt the shooter. Yeah, um, gas escaping from breech loaders is, is all, was a long-standing problem. Now the technical term for it is obturation. So this is an obturator. Now it's not made of, of brass, as sometimes obturating components are. The most famous obturating component being a cartridge case. Because once you've got a metallic cartridge case, you don't have to worry about any of this mess or any of the other, like the, the rubber um, obturator in a chassepot rifle, for example. All of that goes out the window and your ammunition seals the breech itself. Much better than this, but Green was trying very hard and he came up with a system that did work. So prior to the, the 2000 carbines being ordered, there was a trial at Hythe, the School of Musketry at Hythe. They reported accuracy up to 400 yards was superior, and by superior, they mean superior to the Sharps carbine and the Leech carbine, L-E-E-T-C-H, uh, and possibly the Prince pattern carbine. So there were at least three, um, all American, I believe, types of new breech loading carbine being trialed and the green was said to be superior up to 400 yards. And interestingly, most importantly, there was no escape of gas at the breach, even after 280 rounds without cleaning or lubrication, which is very impressive for black powder, which of course is what we're dealing with here. Uh, the effective rate of fire was apparently 10 rounds per minute, which again is, is pretty impressive for this era. Um, very impressive for this era, actually. And on the basis of that trial, as I say, 2,000 were ordered. And these are both British pattern greens. Um, they're covered in British proof marks. You might be able to see. And the big dead giveaway is the Royal Cipher crown over VR. And I believe the X between the V and the R is an indicator of American, or at least foreign, production. Um, at this time when um, Pattern 53 rifles, for example, were ordered from foreign countries, you'd have the same Crown VR, but you'd have different symbols between the V and the R. And so I believe that the X here denotes American manufacture. And certainly the other markings are what you'd expect to see. Uh, Massachusetts Arms Company, Chicopee Falls, USA, 1856. We don't have any uh, unit markings on these. We only have a, a one, which I believe would stand for first class reserve. So what initially happened to these, um, well, the initial plan was to equip the sort of teeth cavalry, the, cav the frontline cavalry that were going to be fighting in the Crimea. But by the time these things were in any um, fit state to be issued, uh, the Crimea was over anyway. The Cartridge seems to have been the problem. Not The trials were fine, but the military decided they needed a more robust cartridge. A, a paper cartridge wasn't enough for them. They wanted something made of skin. Um, or I believe in 18, as late as 1865, they were trying out a linen cartridge. And what they couldn't find was the balance between a material that could be easily pierced by this system for reliable ignition and one that was tough enough to be rattling around in the pouches of cavalrymen's kit. And for one reason or another, it just never panned out. And so these were never issued to frontline cavalry. There was a plan to issue some to the Royal Cape Mounted Rifles, which doesn't seem to have come to anything. But then we encounter an interesting um, footnote to the story, which we can't represent because we don't have one with this marking. 
but there are some out there with the marking R, D, M, R, and a letter and a number, classic uh, cavalry unit marking. And it's believed that that stands for the Royal Devon Mounted Rifles and that these guys did get, well, we don't know how many, enough to equip a troop, um, perhaps more than that. Sadly, we don't know. So these are an interest, or this uh, is an interesting, it, it's neither a prototype that went nowhere, nor is it a, a generally issued weapon. It's kind of just gets into use, but we know sadly very little about that actual usage. Other than with this, as I say, um, the Royal Devon Mounted Rifle, so they would be a, a, a yeomanry uh, unit. So if you're not familiar with that, yeomanry are essentially a form of militarized police. Uh, mounted, organized along military lines, you can bring them out if there are riots, famously, um, that, that kind of thing. So they're, they're, not, they're not combat troops per se, and it, just, it seems that these were just you know, there were hundreds of these things lying around in the Tower of London, let's make use of them. So, sometime in the 1860s. Now, by 1863, Britain had already decided that the Wesley Richards system, the so-called monkey tail, perhaps one for another day, was the best system. And that was in use until the 1890s with reserve cavalry. So, quite a successful system, um, unlike this. this. This is one of those nearly nearly made it kind of guns of history. So the reason that I got both of these out for you today, apart from just we had two in this store, so I seemed ashamed to leave one lonely on the shelf, um, is that one of them was essentially laid up in the Tower of London with its, with its friends for, <laughs> for a very long time. And then in the early 20th century, most of those were disposed of. Some were sold, some were broken up. Um, this one, so this, this one that looks, looks in better condition, because it is, actually has sold out of service markings on it, which means that it was marked, ready for sale um, to the civilian world. That happened quite a bit. Seems surprising that such a, an advanced weapon might be sold off, but, you know, five years later, this thing isn't that advanced anymore. So this one was, was um, in theory, sold off, but what actually happened is that it was transferred to the pattern room collection at the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield. So this was their example of a green carbine. Uh, whereas this one just stayed at the Tower of London. Had, ironically, a harder life because it's got it's missing more finish. It's got um, various early museum labels attached to it. Um, so they are, they are functionally identical, but they've had two slightly different uh, parallel histories and they've come back together when the pattern room collection was acquired by the Royal Armouries. So they are back together. Um, we have another one of these in store, actually. So in case anyone's wondering about differences, that typically when a foreign country procures a weapon from, from you as an inventor or, or a factory that's making it, they do specify differences, and the green was no exception. So the 22-inch barrel of the American greens was shortened down to 18, so a fair bit lighter and handier, actually. And this is a hefty system because of all of this um, mechanical stuff going on here. So that makes, makes some sense. Uh, for units that are supposed to be light and nimble, um, the, well, allegedly the caliber was slightly reduced. Um, I haven't taken any calipers to these, but these are supposed to be 0.54 caliber, not 0.55, which seems like spitting hairs to me, but apparently that is a difference as well. Other than that, it's just the markings. Um, and a few that are out there with, with unit markings as well. You might have spotted these guys have patch boxes. So um, maybe, maybe for storing skittles in for, for uh, our American military friends that uh, know that, that meme. <laughs> Actually, not for, not for skittles and not for patches either. They almost certainly would have been for the priming reels for the for the Maynard system. So you would be able to carry a couple, well, more than a couple actually in there. In fact, you can see the shape of this cutout is suggestive of storing multiple reels of Maynard priming. You wouldn't need patches in here because the cartridge was not fully self-contained because it doesn't have the primer in it, but it's as self-contained as far as patching goes. You don't need to separately put a patch around a ball which is traditionally what patch boxes are for. So in other words, it's called a patch box. It wouldn't have functioned as a patch box. 
Uh, so the only other thing to mention would be the sights. So you have a, a combat sight when it's laid flat along the barrel, and then you flip the thing up, and you can manually adjust the slider up to 600 yards. Now that's quite a realistic sighting uh, arrangement for, for this period. Often, often they're out a lot further than 600 yards. So it gives you an idea of how closely cavalry might be engaging if 600 yards is their absolute maximum that they're expected to lob shots in at, because you would be lobbing them in. To align those sights, that's a, that's a fair old angle. You were going to be using it a lot closer than that for the most part. Thanks as always for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, we're here every week and you can also play along over on social media before the video actually drops. That's on Facebook and Instagram. We have a Twitter account as well that you might want to look at. Uh, our website is pretty important if you actually want to come and visit us because we are open at our three sites. Um, so I hope you are able to visit us. If you're not, we'll see you again next time. Thanks very much.